Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. I haven't seen you if you haven't joined me for math yesterday. I wouldn't have spoken to you. And I hope that you have had a good break and that you're ready to tackle this final, final term. Yay, before the long holidays. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about aqueous reactions and aqueous solutions. So um, basically, it's a continuation of what we we're talking about last in the last lesson, um, which was last term. So um, I've actually revised a little bit. In other words, I've gone back a little bit, not too much, just to make sure that you guys can understand what I am talking about. So first of all, let's talk about when we talk about reactions and aqueous solutions, we're talking about something that dissolves in water. So in order to understand why things dissolve in water, we actually need to understand the nature of water. So the first thing we're going to discuss is the polarity of water. So it says an aqueous solution is a solution where the solvent is water, okay, as I've mentioned. And it says, why is water such a good solvent? And the answer is its structure. It's all to do with its structure. So the water molecule, as you guys know, consists of, I mean, you guys all know, it's basically an oxygen with two fixed, basically Mickey Mouse ears, which are the hydrogens, okay? But what you need to know is that, and this obviously the Cooper structure of water, oxygen's got two, bonds, one each for the hydrogens. It is held together with a covalent bond with the two hydrogens. So it's held together with the covalent bond. You also need to realize that you need to know more or less, as in just the range of the length of these bonds, which is 95.84 picometers. Now PM stands for picometers um, and just in case you don't remember what picometers is, let me go through it with you. So let me just change color. You have got milli, micro, nano and then pico. Okay and if you had to go up there would be kilo, giga, Kilo, mega, giga. It's actually mega. Always do that. Giga and tera. Okay. And these stand for the number of basically it's, it's, it's decimal situation. In other words, if I had one meter, yeah, we can do, obviously these milli, micro, nano, and pico, and kilo, mega, giga, and tera are the prefixes. Okay, so what you need to know is that if I say milli meter, it could be milli second, milli um, gram, milli whatever, okay? But in this case, we're going to talk about meters. So if I say millimeter, I mean 10 to the minus 3, okay? If I say micro, I'm talking 10 to the minus 6. Nano is 10 to the minus 9 and pico is 10 to the minus 12. So when we've got 95.84 picometers here, we're saying it's 95,84 times by 10 to the negative 12 meters. Okay, so just to get you to understand exactly what that is, that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 9, 5, 8, 4 meters. That is how long this bond is. So you can see it's actually a very, 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 very small bond. Okay, so now the bond length obviously is quite short, but then with respect to other atoms, I mean molecules, it's normal. And you can see here yeah, that the angle between the two hydrogens is 104.45 degrees and that is caused by your unshared pairs of electrons. So let me show you. What happens is oxygen is in group six, right? Is in group six. 
So when we do its valence electrons using the Lewis structure, what do we do? We go one, two, because that's the 1s orbital. Then we go two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. So we've got six. Okay, so do you see that that's why there ends up being a hydrogen here? and a hydrogen there. I'm just redrawing this really. So that's why the hydrogen's over here. But what now happens, I'm just gonna see if I've, yes. What now happens is there's a rule and the rule tells us how the electrons um, repel each other. So what happens is the unshared pairs of electrons repel, that should say repel, not repulse, sorry. Repel the shared pairs of electrons, okay? So the, the hierarchy is that the unshared pairs of electrons have got a much greater repulsion for each other, okay? But then they've got a bigger repel, they, they strongly repel the shared pairs of electrons, shared pairs of electrons. So in other words, what happens is these un pair, unshared pair of electrons actually repel these and push them down, which is why this angle happens to be 104.45 degrees, why that angle is 104.45 degrees, because it's being pushed down by these two unshared pairs of electrons. And that gear causes the angular shape of the water molecule. Now, why is that important? Because what it does is it actually changes its polarity. Okay, and the polarity depends on two things. It depends on the shape and on the electronegativity. So, obviously, the reason the shape is important is because if I'm coming along from this side and I'm the size of this molecule, I will see only the oxygen, okay? Whereas if I'm coming from this side, I will see only the hydrogens. So that is why the shape is important and why it affects the polarity, okay? And oxygen will be, because it has a greater attraction to electrons, it's going to be slightly negative, and the hydrogens is going to be slightly positive. But that's to do with electronegativity. So what is electronegativity? Electronegativity is a measure of how strongly an atom holds onto its own electrons or are strongly detract other electrons to it. Okay, so it's a measure of how strongly an atom holds onto its electrons or how strongly it attracts other electrons to it. So we've got here a table. Now your periodic table isn't colored in like this and it also doesn't have these big numbers. Your periodic table's got the electronegativity numbers but they're much smaller and there is space for your um, your formula mass, sorry, I say your atomic mass, your relative atomic mass, okay? And also for your proton number. So, um, what you've got here is you can see this is just an electronegativity table. And the way they've colored it in is you can see that 0.5 to 0.9 is like this um, icy blue okay or c blue then 1 to 1.4 is a very light blue um a 1.5 to 1.9 tends to be so close to that i can't tell the difference twos are the whites okay and then we get to the higher electronegativities so the oranges tend to be from 2.5 or 2 2.9 the pinks tend to be from 3 to 3.5, the dark pink 3.6 to 3.9, which you don't seem to have any of, and the red is 4 plus. So what do you notice? Okay, you notice that the electronegativity ranges from francium over here, francium and cesium, which have got francium and cesium and they have a very low electronegativity it's very low very low electronegativity and what does that mean it means that they very easily react they very easily give away their hydrogen i mean the electrons okay 
The highest electronegativity is up here with fluorine. So fluorine has got the highest electronegativity, it's highest, so it very strongly holds on to its electrons. Okay, so when we're trying to measure what type of bond is formed in a molecule, we look at the electronegativity. And if the electronegativity is, we looked at the electronegativity difference. So let's say, for example, we've got water. Let me just see what they've got. Yeah, they're doing water next time. So let's do hydrogen chloride, HCl. The electronegativity of hydrogen is 2,1, and the electronegativity of chlorine is 3. So do you agree that the electronegativity difference is 3 minus 2,1, which is 0,9? nine okay there's the chlorine there's the hydrogen okay that's not coming nine now remember that and then let's talk about water okay so if we look at water's electronegativity we've got hydrogen at 2.1 and we've got oxygen at 3.5 okay so which of these has got the great electronegativity? Do you agree that oxygen has got the great electronegativity? It is sitting at 3.5 compared to hydrogen's 2.1. So therefore, oxygen is holding onto its electrons much more strongly than hydrogen, okay? So that means that the electrons is gonna spend, I mean, this doesn't look like anything, but if I had to draw it like it's supposed to be, this is supposedly a sphere, and then you've got a hydrogen, which is kind of embedded, okay? And then you've got another hydrogen, which is kind of embedded. Now, remember that these aren't solid balls. It's just where they are most likely, these, these lines here that I'm drawing, these outer orbitals, are just where you're most likely to find your electrons, okay? Just where you're most likely to find your electrons. So what you're seeing is an overlap of the orbital of the hydrogen and the orbital of the oxygen. So if the oxygen has got a higher electronegativity than hydrogen, it means the electron that belongs to the hydrogen is going to spend way more time around the oxygen than it would around the hydrogen. Okay, do you understand that? So what we are saying is that the higher the electronegativity, the more strongly that atom is holding on to the electrons, which mean that those electrons, oh, those electrons um, are basically spending more time around that oxygen atom than they are around the hydrogen atom, which means that at any point in time, we'll see this is slightly negative and this is slightly positive. So the hydrogen society is said to be more positive than the oxygen and we call this a dipole because it's got a slightly negative end and it's got a slightly positive end. So it's a dipole. Now that polar nature actually allows it to dissolve certain substances and that's why this is important. Okay, so if you've got an ionic substance okay, then it makes sense that it would be ideal that the electronegative difference would, I mean, that it would dissolve in polar substances, okay. So let's just talk about an ionic so a solid. An ionic solid is one in which the atoms, the electronegativity in the atoms um, in a molecule is greater than 1.9. In other words, if you've got an electronegative difference is greater than 1.9 then you have an ionic bonding occurring you have an ionic bonding occurring this means there's strong electrostatic static forces holding the atoms together in the molecule so let's look at sodium chloride for example you've got sodium which is na which is 0, 0,9 you've got chlorine which is 3 over here so the electronegativity difference is going to be 3 minus 0, 0,9, which is 2.1. So therefore, this is an ionic, it's ionic, okay. So since water is polar and the deal is that like dissolves in like, then we can say that our ionic molecules are going to dissolve in the polar 
water. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens when we add an ionic substance to water. Um, I just want to see if there's a little video here. Yeah. No, okay. So first of all, here's a little video. No? Hmm, it's very sad. Okay, okay. So let's talk about it, okay? What happens is the water molecules come near the sodium chloride crystal, okay? Now what you need to understand is the sodium, the sodium chloride crystal is a macromolecule. It is made up of sodium chloride ions that are in a big structural crystal lattice, okay? And then what happens is the water molecule comes along, la 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 la, okay? Little hydrogens, which are slightly positive, and little oxygen, which is slightly negative. Okay, no problem. Then what happens is that it says when an ionic substance is added to the water, the force of attraction between, occur between the polar water molecules and the positive and negative ions. Okay. And these forces of attraction are intermolecular forces, and there are two types. The one is an ion dipole force, and the other is a weak temporary force okay so one is iron dapple and the other is a weak temporary force so if you look over here you'll see that what happens is this water molecule over here on the left hand side the top left hand side approaches the chloride ion with the hydrogens facing it now the hydrogens are slightly positive okay and the chlorine is negative okay so what happens is it pulls the sodium chloride crystal apart it actually pulls off that chloride ion and then it looks like this the chloride ion is going to be totally surrounded by water okay with all the hydrogens facing in to cancel out the effect of the chloride ion similarly Okay, similarly, if you have the sodium plus ion, what's going to happen is the water molecule is going to turn around and the oxygen is going to face it. Okay, and then it's going to suck out. Again, it's going to break off this sodium plus ion. And then what will happen is it will have water totally surrounding it again, but this time the oxygens, the oxygens will be all are facing it okay so that is what happens in the when the sodium chloride crystals dissolve in water so like i said each ion is surrounded by water molecules and this process is made up of two well this dissolving is made up of two processes one is dissolution and the second one is hydration one is dissolution, the second one is hydration. We need to know, this is very important, you need to know what these definitions are and not confuse dissolution with hydration. So, dissolution is a process in which an ionic substance breaks down its ions when a solvent is added to it. Okay, so dissolution, let's read it again, is in a, in a ionic substance, sorry, as dissolution in an ionic substance in which an ionic substance breaks down into ions when a solvent is added to it. So the dissolution is basically when the sodium chloride crystal broke up into the sodium plus ions and the chloride minus ions. Process in which cations and anions become surrounded by the water molecules in the aqueous solution that but there was hydration. Okay, so when we got surrounded like this, when the chloride ions got totally surrounded by the water, or when the sodium plus ions got totally surrounded by the water, that there was called hydration. Right, now you guys need to know the equation for this, it's very important. And you need to be able to answer using both the word equation and the formula equation. So let's talk about it. We've got sodium chloride, which breaks up into sodium plus ions and chloride minus ions. And you can see here that you write it as NaCl solid, breaks up into Na plus, but now it's aqueous because it's dissolved in water, plus Cl minus because, and again, it's aqueous because it's dissolved in water. Right, 
so that explains how things or why things dissolve in water is all to do with polarity and structure and your electronegativity okay it is very important that you guys know that your your polarity and your electronegativity are the two things that play a huge role in whether or not things are going to be soluble. Now let's talk about electronic and conductivity. So an electrolyte is a solution that conducts an electro, electric current due to the presence of free ions. And that is incredibly important. Grade 10s, there are no electrons flowing in the water. Okay? There are only free ions. So you need to understand, and they love asking this, they'll say, what is an electrolyte? And if you say, oh, it allows the flow of electricity due to free electrons, or it has electrons that allow the flow of electricity, you're going to get it totally wrong. What you need to say is that an electrolyte is a solution that conducts an electric current due to the presence of free ions, free ions. Okay, so this is a typical example of a circuit that has got um, electricity running through it. So you happen to have two inert rods, um, electrodes, they're carb made of carbon, and then you have a voltmeter across it to measure the volts. You've got an ammeter, a resistor, and a battery. Okay. So let's have a look at this little video. So what we've got here is solid sodium chloride. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how the sodium chloride, which has got the sodium and the chloride ions, transmits electricity. Okay, so if you've got solid sodium chloride, you will notice that no electricity is being conducted, that light is not switched on. Okay, even though you've got two electrodes sticking in it, okay? Whereas, if we take that sodium chloride solid and we allow it to dissolve, okay, then suddenly, when we switch this on, the electrolyte cause allows for the electricity to be transferred through the fluid and therefore the light comes on. Okay, so what I want to do is I just want to go through that again. When you've got sodium, solid sodium chloride, there are no free ions. Everything is in that nice giant crystal lattice and there are no free ions. Please notice. Okay, so even though we've got two electrodes and we've got a little light bulb and we switch it on, there'll be no transfer of electricity and therefore the light bulb will stay off. Okay, but if we get a container of water and we dissolve the sodium chloride in, then it breaks up to form sodium plus ions and chloride minus ions, okay? Then what happens is the electricity will be transferred. So you have to have free ions to allow for the transfer of electricity. Okay, so there you go, you have to have free ions. Now let's talk about conductivity. Conductivity is a measure of how well electricity is conducted, okay? And then we're talking not about wires now, remember we're talking about electrolytes, we're talking about how well electricity travels through a liquid. So obviously it makes sense that first of all the type of substance, we know this, okay? If I tried to send an electric current through a piece of plastic, nothing would happen. The worst that would happen is that we'd end up burning the last the the piece of plastic because of trying to send electrons through it and it gets really hot. But there will be no transfer, there will be no electric current flowing through the piece of plastic. Okay, so the type of substance makes a big deal. Some, you need there to be free ions for electricity to flow in your electrolyte. So for example, distilled water is not going to work because distilled water has got no free ions whatsoever. So therefore, it is not going to transfer electricity. Okay, now we need to talk about concentration. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the definition of concentration. Concentration means parts per unit volume. 
okay in other words it's a measure of how many atoms or molecules we're dissolving in a specific amount of water okay so if you look at these two containers and we assume that the little yellow dots are ions that we're dissolving in water let's just count them let's just see what we got here um, okay, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we've got 13 yellow dots in quite a small container. Yeah, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So yeah, we've got 13 dots in a much larger container. So concentration, remember, is parts per unit volume. It's how many atoms and molecule we have that are dissolved in a specific volume of water. So which of these two containers do you think has got the greater concentration? Well, obviously, since the amount of water in the left-hand beaker, the small beaker, is less than the amount of water in the large beaker, it is pretty obvious that this is going to have a higher concentration. It's going to have a higher concentration. Whereas this over here is obviously going to have the lower concentration. Now, the more ions in the electrolyte, the greater the ability to conduct an electric current, which makes sense because remember that ion trans electrons are only transferred or electricity is only transferred due to free ions. So if you do not have a nice lot of free ions, then obviously your electricity is not going to flow. So therefore, the greater the concentration, the better the electrolyte. So in this case, it would pay you rather to choose this smaller container. Now again, we've spoken about substances. Some substances, when dissolved, form ions. Okay, so for example, sodium chloride is highly soluble, dissolves in a table salt. Remember that sodium chloride is just table salt. So what we're doing is saying it's very soluble in water. Okay, very soluble. It forms nice ions. So therefore, um, it, because it's got these nice concentration or high concentration of ions, it conducts electricity well. Sugar is also very soluble in water. You guys know this. If you've ever um, had the situation, you must have at least once in your life had a situation where um, you're having a bit of a bad day or whatever and your parent or somebody says, yeah, have some sugar water for the shock or for whatever it is. And all they've done is dissolve sugar in water. Now, sugar is soluble in water, no problem there, but it does not form ions. Sugar does not form ions. And because it does not form ions, it does not conduct electricity. So therefore, solubility is not a good measure of conductivity. In other words, something can be soluble and not conduct electricity. It has to form ions. Okay. Right. And that's it for today. We will continue with this on what's today today is tuesday we'll continue with this on thursday have a great day